Yes. Hmm. How many of these meetings did you do usually? Once yeah, a week, usually, once a month? Uh, every Saturday, Sunday. Oh, wow. From, yeah, from last, uh, yeah, this is your 12th talk. Very good. Yes. Cool idea. Yeah. <laughs> and even possible in a car. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I am always in a car, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I have to I have to apologize for Prashant. I never uh, wrote him in the acknowledgments because I never knew his name before. But you're included in the acknowledgments, Prashant. Okay. Oh no problem. Thanks. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we are live now in YouTube also. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let me welcome now. Yeah, that's a better thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, welcome, yeah. welcome to all, especially welcome to Peter, who has, uh, without any hesitation, just when Atul spoke to you, you have just, uh, oh, you said okay for us and you are ready for a beautiful talk here and you are making our Sunday evening very special here in India and across the world too. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation and uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Atul, who has uh, made this. Uh, and uh, also to oh thank, welcome, yeah, and I am I am welcoming everyone who are here in the Zoom and also who are viewing through YouTube. So welcome to each and everyone. And I request uh, Dr. Atul to introduce Peter to all the audience oh. uh, uh, globally. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you, Abhijit. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Abhijit. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today who is going to talk to us about taxonomy on a planet with crisis. So our speaker today is a section head of arachnology at Senckenberg. He has 57 scientific publications and more than 77 popular publications all on Arani. He has described 400 species, 17 species groups, and eight genera, again, all on Arani. He has described many species from all over the world and has made about 27 research travels to countries like China, seven times to China, 13 times to Laos, Thailand twice, Myanmar, Malaysia, Singapore, and of course, India. Uh, he uses taxonomic names to raise awareness for our planet in crisis. I think IP names, the most popular amongst them being the heteropoda David Bowie. Or names referring to human overpopulation like the heteropoda homes to for homo stultus, which means stupid human. Uh, this heteropoda David Bowie, I can very well relate to as I know he's an ardent fan of one of the greatest glam rock singer David Bowie. I hope you remember. Uh, uh, he's been a part of various Congress visits since 1995 in Europe, Asia, Africa, and America. He's quite often seen on media, that is on press, radio, and TV, and was a part of the BBC documentary, Wild Things with Dominic Monaghan, on a search for Heteropoda Maxima in Laos. He has been a part of the most recent publication, The Spider Families of the World, book along with late Dr. Norman Platnik and other arachnologists. Ladies and gentlemen, so please welcome our speaker for today, Dr. Peter Yeager. Welcome, Dr. Peter. The Zoom meeting is all yours. Thank you very much, Atul, and thank you for uh, organizing also to Abhijit and Prashant. It's the first time I make such a meeting, uh, and yeah, I'm quite excited. And although I'm 52 years, I'm still learning, so uh, yeah, we'll see how it will go. Um, yeah, why should we describe species on a planet in crisis? We could, let's say, start, I have to see, ah, no, okay. Uh, probably all of you will agree that our planet is a bit overpopulated with humans, not with spiders, of course. Uh, we have now more than seven billions. Uh, we have uh, modelings which say, which, uh, yeah, say that we are probably 13 or 20 billion one time and uh, probably we will also agree that this is not the 
the best goal we should approach. And uh, of course, we see now already deforestation in the large scale, not only in the Amazon, but everywhere in the world. Uh, we see plastic waste is swimming in the oceans. Actually, this is a protest in the River Spree. Uh, and we see housings everywhere. And that you can only see barley, barley, some forest with probably some spiders left there. And all this uh, we know together with the climate change, uh, we see that our planet is in serious crisis here. And so we could say, okay, yeah, does it make sense to describe all the diversity? Uh, yeah, probably we should just live and enjoy our lives and then there go extinct any. Oh, so this could be, but of course, we wouldn't join this meeting if we uh, yeah, would be of this opinion. And so uh, this is actually the nature we love. It, it doesn't matter whether it's aquatic habitats or terrestrial habitats. This is nature where uh, how we love it. And you will also agree that these wonderful beetles or probably butterflies, it's really enjoyable and uh, should be protected in a way for future generations, um, but also because we as humans have a brain and we can shape our future as the only being in the world. So we are responsible for all this biological heritage. And But not only uh, beetles and butterflies are beautiful, we have also some jewels <laughs> in, in the arachnology. So um, here... <clears throat> is a choice of the genus Maratus, very small uh, jumping spiders from Australia, which got really famous by Jürgen Otto and many co-workers now. And there are more than 80 species, as far as I know, uh, described right now. And they are very beautiful spiders and everyone will uh, certainly agree that this is really worth to be protected. And it would be a really a big loss when we just have all these species extinct. Sorry, that was a uh, mosquito here. <laughs> we have actually here also global warming. We have outside uh, 37 degrees. Uh, in the sun, it's 56 degrees. And here in my office, it's 28 degrees. So, uh, and I hope the fan is not too loud. So if one of the organizers has some problems to understand me, then let me know. Okay, now I want to connect the scientific part a bit with the citizen scientific part, because I know from the Indian organizers uh, that there are so many people, of course, I, I, I have met some of you in, in, on Facebook or elsewhere, uh, that really uh, take care for the nature, loves nature, take photos and would like to ID the spiders. And here are some random photos I, I, I took from uh, Facebook, uh, wonderful pictures and it was just in my mind that we probably can join forces and could help our planet together to get out of this crisis, if not the politicians and the lobbyists and all these <clears throat> uh, people who don't want to uh, save this planet uh, react to this crisis. Okay, so citizen science, nature love, all of us can make a difference and finally rule the world. This is probably a bit big, let's take hope but uh, you know when we have no hopes then it's too late so I will start I, I will tell you about taxonomy and I will start with our taxonomic center in the brain uh, you see here uh, marked in red the inferior temporal lobe these are two uh, uh, paired structures in our brain which are good for recognizing categorizing things one half is for living things and one half is for non-living things and um, this is also good for face perception and recognition of and so on and so forth. But <clears throat> you can easily uh, um, yeah, know what is meant by this taxonomic center if you um, listen to the first example. It was Ernst Meyer, a famous biologist, going to Papua New Guinea, and he actually identified birds in a special region. And the indigenous people also had their knowledge on these birds. And Ernst Meyer had only, I think, seven birds more than the indigenous people out of 170 or so, uh, seven, yeah, 70. So this means the indigenous people use their so-called folk taxonomy to distinguish 
between all these species and they knew the nature as good as Ernst Meyer did with his PhD and so on. So, and another example is that ask a children, what is a fish, what is a bird? They can easily distinguish, although bird and fish is not a proper term. Of course, these are feathered dinosaurs, but this is probably a bit too complicated for children and for uh, normal people, let's say. So we know what birds are, we know what fish are, and that's easy to recognize. And it's probably a similar thing with spiders and their webs. So probably you would also agree that everyone can uh, recognize an old web and an old weaver then, or a mentulite, like this beautiful Tifelchema uh, celadonia, or a wool spider with a nice eye arrangement, uh, jumping spiders, of course. And then I added, you see already, I added some problematic cases. So for example, you have two daddy long legs. One is a falset in the middle, and to the left, you see a harvest name. Then you have <clears throat> on the bottom left also an oak weaver, but we don't know whether it's a real Araniid or it's a Nephilid, it's a family on its own. This is not clear and we cannot use or solve this problem with our uh, inferior temporal lobe. This is only good for a very first approach. But anyhow, our inferior temporal lobe is working all the time. We cannot, we cannot switch it off. Uh, um, so, and the last uh, example is, of course, a black widow in the middle, and then uh, to the right, the false widow or one false widow, uh, Stertola paikuliana from the Mediterranean. So, when we uh, see these uh, restrictions we have in recognizing or identifying species, then probably we should ask what is science versus citizen science? And probably I, I try to make one. Uh, explanation or definition, scientists need an exact identification to connect species ID with behavior, ecology, or whatever parameters. Citizen scientists want an identification, but don't need it actually, just out of curiosity, or in other words now, to satisfy the taxonomic center in their brain. But why not joining forces? So why not connecting these weirdos in the lab with these microscopes and yeah, yeah my, my hairs are almost like this. And all these nature lovers, the, the real, the, 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 the big group of amateurs and, and citizen scientists outside there. And why not joining together and not saying versus, but science with citizen science. Yeah. So this would be uh, my, my yeah, dream, let's say, that it can come true. But when I, when I see the Facebook scene, then I see that it might be possible and um, we, we need probably one steps, uh, some steps to go um, to yeah, fulfill some final goals. I will talk later about that. First of all, I would um, uh, yeah, explain what I understand um, as, as taxonomy. Uh, so for example, active taxonomy, passive taxonomy, I dis discern these two parts, let's say active taxonomy is something when you describe species like all the, the salticids of the genus Myrm Arachna, um, and you make some descriptions and so on, give names to them. That's I call active taxonomy. If you use some field guides and recognize or identify species, then we are in the field of passive taxonomy. You use also these taxonomic tools and this is also connected to the citizen science, of course, then. Then um, taxonomy can be used, of course, to reconstruct evolutionary pathways, lineages to the, to the history. Um, and you can, and this is probably uh, today also more important than phylogenies or something like this, we can, we can communicate about species. When they have a name, we can communicate about species and when, then we can uh, try to do nature conservation. We can talk to press and media. We can have some documentaries like I did with uh, Dominic Monaghan. Probably when I never give a name to Heteropoda maxima, then probably never, it never happened, would happen that, uh, or would have happened, sorry, uh, that uh, we had a BBC documentary on this uh, nice spider species. Okay. Taxonomy <clears throat> had not only recently, but in in the last decades, let's say, 
uh, got another touch, let's say. Um, it was not only describing species, but of course, uh, searching for systematic relationships. Um, it started, let's say, it probably did not really start, but I, I, I had this as an example. Willis Gerch and Platnik in 1976 uh, published this nice tree on the left side in black and white. And, and so uh, they tried to find shared characters and try to uh, find out which groups are more related to each other than to others. So this is all called cladistics. And um, you can do this also not only with morphological characters, but with molecular characters. And then you will get such a nice tree like Wheeler et al. published in 2017. And um, yeah, it is, it is interesting how they are related. But anyhow, the descriptive alpha taxonomy is suffering a bit because all the grant money is going to these programs, let's say. And the real problem is that we have a cup of coffee and we have a nice uh, yeah, top of cream, let's say. And this cream is um, the phylogenetic uh, content, which is published today as, yeah, as a high impact factor paper, let's say. And all the other cold coffee, which means the alpha taxonomic descriptions are not done anymore. Uh, I heard from a friend in, in Beijing, Li Xuxiang, that for example, the uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences wouldn't accept uh, those papers from students any longer. So they are even not allowed to publish these papers in alpha taxonomic uh, field. So um, yeah, as you know, I'm quite active in describing species, I hope I can describe more, probably I won't reach uh, uh, 2000 like Norm Plitnik, Plitnik did, but uh, I, I still uh, try to do as many as I can. Um, when we see the development of spider species described per year, this is from the World Spider Catalog, um, then you see that Industrial Revolution, probably also uh, zoo taxa had a big impact um, in um, stimulating describing species. And now we can say that there are probably 500 to 1000 species described per year. So now you could say, okay, oh, Peter, that's not a problem. You, you told us that the descriptive alpha taxonomy is decreasing and there's no grant money. Yeah, this is true. And actually this number is probably to certain journals like Zoo Taxa, Zoo Keys, who can really publish large revisions today, which was formerly in these printed uh, versions, not possible in, in, in easily, let's say, in this way. And secondly, it is also due to very um, dedicated taxonomists who are doing all this sometimes in their, yeah, in their free time, um, yeah, just as honorary work. So, okay, now let's, let's see this blue bar, which are the thousand species we described per year, let's say. Now, we know that there are more than 48,000 known spider species on this planet, according to the World Spider Catalog. And you see the blue column there, which is really quite small in, in terms of what we, what we described in the history, during the history. And when we are going a step further and trying to imagine how many species are there actually, then this is a green bar right now, then we know that it's probably 90% which is unknown. So we have to describe still 452 thousand species and uh, these 1,000 spider species seem to be quite a lot. It's now only a very flat bar at the bottom and so we would have to uh, describe a long, long time to uh, see all the diversity described. The problem now is, as you saw probably in the uh, animated picture here, that in the meantime when we are talking about this, some species disappeared from the screen. This means they became extinct because of uh, what I showed before, the de deforestation, um, climate change, and our uh, negative impact of the human uh, to the nature. So therefore, I consider that we have to hurry up to see half as a treasure. And if it has names, probably we can even 
protect it better and uh, find some solutions. Okay, now a small loop just to show um, uh, to the non-scientific uh, arachnologists what we as descriptive taxonomists have to, um, <clears throat> in terms of, uh, yeah, which, which characters are important and so on. So, um, and, and probably also to stress that we cannot identify some um, spider species just posted as a picture in, in Facebook, okay? Um, in some cases we can, but only in rare cases. Um, so it is about spider pornography. Uh, why is it these copulatory organs? Because these are the most complex structures in our knee and they have a really wide area for differentiation in the course of the evolution and actually we can identify and distinguish all of the or almost all of the 48,000 plus species in the world by their copulatory organs. Similarly it is done also in the millipedes and in the fleas. Myriapoda and Siphonoptera have also similarly complex uh, copulatory organs. And so these are the structures for identifying spider species. Um, and this is used since Carolus Clerk in 1757. I will show you the original book here. Um, it is more than, oh, ah, uh, it's not the front page, just a moment. We have some time, Arthur, right? In Abhijit. So this is uh, the front page there. It's about Swedish spiders and it is published in uh, Latin and it's Swedish language. It, uh, Clerk uh, was active at the same time as Linné, and he described 63 species, and he already, at that time, more than 250 years ago, used these sexual characters, these copulatory organs, like this male pulp of Micromata virescens, um, to distinguish between the species. So, and this is still the case. So, what, what do we have to do as a taxonomist. So when we have a male spider, we would cut off uh, the patella and femur, or between patella and femur, is, the femur is involved. If there are also apophysis, of course, we would uh, uh, keep it there. And usually the left pulp is cut. So um, it is a bit of a standard, let's say, standard procedure. Then we would get rid of uh, bristle CD hairs, which would cover some very important structures, which we would like to see. Uh, for the identification and put it then in a the right position. This means a certain ventral view or a dorsal view. In this case, a more a retrolateral view or a prolateral view then. And then we would take either a photo. I would, I will tell something about photos and drawings a bit later. And then I would make a drawing. This is not the exact the same species, but you can see that a drawing is a very abstract mirror picture of uh, the real, real pulp, let's say. Uh, a photo can provide some more information about, for example, the color, the degree of scler sclerotization, or some hairs, which I would omit in the drawings just for time purposes, let's say. The same we see in the female. We have here an adult female, and you can easily uh, recognize here the epigyne uh, on the ventral side of the opisthosoma. Um, when we enlarge it, we see here the epigyne, and we would cut this structure out. First cut, left, uh, uh, right of the epigyne, then transversal cut here, and then back to the epigastric furrow, and then we would cut it out and would, uh, clear it chemically. Uh, first of all, first of all, manually, but then chemically with lactic acid. I use phosphoracids in other uh, spider groups, love oil or even enzymes or KOH. Um, depends a bit on the group on, and the sclerotization. And then I'll put again in the right position here, ventral or dorsal view, and then illustrate. And here I would like to stress a really important thing. Um, with digital photography, um, it is really a fashion right now in some countries and some labs uh, by some persons uh, that there are only photos taken and this is 
it's the base then for, or used as a basis for the description of the species. But as you see here, for example, here in the epigyne, you will see certain structures, uh, ridges and so on, which are not depicted here. And the same is true for some structures which are shivering through the cuticle here. This is the internal duct system. Even the lumina can be discerned here in the um, drawing, in the scientific drawing, but it's not possible here. So therefore, I really ask everyone who would like to do serious taxonomy to use scientific drawings. Um, this is a slide actually from a, a taxonomic uh, workshop in Chiang Mai, I don't know, 2015 or so, uh, organized by Emma Shaw and um, uh, also some Thai co-workers uh, like Yuri. And um, yeah, on the right side, you see some, in my opinion, excellent drawings and pictures by some Chinese colleagues and on the left side, you see some other examples. And I will <laughs> clearly try to say that this is really not good for taxonomy as, as it is now, right now. Because if you cannot identify the species by these things, we have names, we have to cope with these names. And this is really a burden. Yeah, um, You are not doing a favor to anyone to describe these species in this fashion. And um, people asking me sometimes, yeah, but Peter, I don't have a microscope. And I say, yeah, okay, but if you don't have a car, would you go to a highway with a bicycle? No, you won't. And if you have no molecular lab, would you do some molecular stuff? No, you can't. So if you don't have a microscope and do some drawings, don't do taxonomy. It's quite easy. I know it is very tempting to do that, but. Uh, in, in, in many cases, you will agree in, in, in some decades that uh, this photo taxonomy is not really good. So I will end this here. Um, it's not a discussion. So my, my um, definition of good taxonomy is taxonomy is only then good when a described species is identified the second time by someone else I had to add. So this boy or girl, I don't say, hey, dad, it's a male of Sinopodascuria and it's on a stone here. And the dad says, okay, let's use our inferior temporal lobe. So uh, just coming back to our textile center uh, we have inherited in our brain. Okay, so now I uh, will leave the taxonomy. Um, I probably gave you some insights in, in what I, what's my opinion. It's my personal opinion. You need not to agree and probably we can clear this in the discussion afterwards. Um, and now I will try to give some examples and try to also make understand how a taxonomist who describes species, how a taxonomist feels, because we are also human beings, we have also emotions and so on, right? So uh, this picture on the left show on the, uh, on the peak of the Natma town, the so-called Mount Victoria in Burma. Um, I was there with Professor Martens, my um, um, PhD supervisor. And yeah, when I collected there in the night um, around the uh, small villa there where we stayed, some uh, big pseudopoda. And um, I recognized them in the lab, only in the lab, of course, it is a, a yet undescribed species and had to give a name. I used the name T. This is Burmese for large. Uh, probably there are some Burmese now around and hopefully I pronounce it well. So, <clears throat> um, and yeah, when you are let's say, giving a name to a spider species, then you feel a bit proud probably, but also responsible for the species and uh, you, you care. And this is probably best shown in this nice song. Um, this is Le Chant des Arachnologistes. Um, the text is written by Pierre Bonnet. Pierre Bonnet once made a really nice spider catalog uh, before Platnik. It was at the same time, almost like Röwe. and. It is like this. vous êtes nos amours, oui, nos amours, scorpion phalangide. Okay, I, I, my, my French is not so good, but we actually sang this song at every European meeting. Yeah, we promised it, Pierre Bonnet, and now it is uh, not sang, sung anymore, but okay. 
um, if you would like to have it, um, probably I can send you a copy. And in this, uh, in this uh, song, it is about how to find spiders and they are so nice and all the arachnids and so on. And uh, then if you find a difference, this is one passage, it is a new species. Oh, what a chance. Baptize it immediately with a new name. You are its daddy. So this shows probably best that uh, you have to take care for this species you have described. And uh, of course, you can be proud of uh, your children. Uh, this is also possible. So let's go on with some of my children. Um, <clears throat> you know, probably the uh, genus Sinoporta I described in 1999. Actually, it was the first ever taxon I described. Um, and uh, these are. Um, yeah, occurring in, in many uh, parts in Southeast Asia, but also in South Asia, Asia and East Asia. And uh, probably you have noticed that uh, my PhD student uh, finished a nice paper with, uh, I don't know how many uh, new species, um, I think 47 new species or so of Sinoporta species. And um, in Laos, there's a special situation. Um, we have Many or um, almost all species in Laos occur in caves. And we have um, in many species also a reduction of eyes. So, for example, here we have Sinopoda song. Song is a Lao language, it means two. And this has only two remnants of eyes. And Sinopoda scurion, which is uh, named after the Swiss uh, company who provided money for uh, some major protection things, uh, uh, this has is completely ice. And these two species here are occurring in caves and are only known from these two caves. And they are only 13 kilometers away, apart from each other. OK, so the yellow arrow points to a quarry. And I was a bit worried about the quarry because when you see now how many quarries are now established there in the vicinity of these type localities of these two species, um, then you can think of that I'm as a daddy for these two species. I'm a bit concerned about their well-being. And um, of course, I cannot uh, say to the Laotian people, just stop it because there are some spiders. Probably they would laugh at me. But I will show you an example in the very last slide where it really happened, where a spider stopped a quarry. Anyhow, um, here in this um, example, I probably can um, yeah, ask also for help. I know many of you are going for holidays or probably live in, in, in Laos or live in Thailand close by. And probably you are uh, cavers and, and are really interested in looking for spiders and, and, and taking some pictures. And please, if you see something like this, take a picture, probably uh, send it to me, and then we can work on the distribution map and see whether it's really so, a sm so small range endemics and so uh, threatened uh, then by the scoring, or probably it's, it's not the truth and it is uh, more widely distributed. Yeah. OK, another example, species playing hide and seek. Yeah, that's a very funny thing. Um, I have a colleague who's working on beetles, Dami Kovac, um, now this year retired, actually. And he found in 1994 and 2003 in two localities, which are almost 2,000 kilometers apart, uh, in Mae Hong Son province here in northern Thailand, and by in Ulo Gombak, very close to Kuala Lumpur, um, a spider species only occurring in bamboo. I described it as Rutumna Gatmangel. And um, I was wondering, why is it only known from these two places? Actually, I think it is because arachnologists are not looking into bamboo tubes and looking for spiders there, because these holes where the legs of the spiders are sticking out here right now, uh, these are made by beetles. And it is only the ecologist Dami Kovac who looked for these beetles and other insects living in the internodes of the bamboos. Um, that he discovered this. And I guess uh, bamboo loggers wouldn't care for the spiders they see. So probably this would explain this large gap 
of knowledge, of course, between um, these two distribution points. So actually also here, if you are living in vicinity here um, and or in between, just have a look when you saw a nice, when you see a nice bamboo forest, uh, go with a head torch in the night and look for Ritimna Gat Mangal. I would be happy to know some more distribution points of these nice species. And of course, Atul uh, mentions this already. My favorite species is still Hedgepoda David Bowie, not because I'm a big fan, but because the spider species together in connection with this name um, yeah, um, gave me so wonderful moments in my life. Yeah, it's, it's really true. Uh, for example, um, at the point in 2008 when I described it, it was more than 330,000 Google hits when you searched for this name. Then I was invited by Thomas Aracino, uh, architect and uh, artist, uh, to the World Science Festival in New York. I gave a lecture in Brooklyn about the species and um, I was invited also by Thomas to the Arachnid Orchestra Jam Session in Singapore in the uh, Museum for Contemporary Art. And actually it was Heteroporter David Bowie Males, which I caught the night before together with my daughters and Thomas and so on. And they made the drumming sound when they do the courtship for the females. And we uh, just, um, yeah, made this sound louder and then it was played into these uh, orchestra jam sessions. Okay. And here again, citizen scientists, if you want, were involved. The species by me in 2006 already by pet keepers here in Germany. And they asked, hey, Peter, you are a specialist for sparacids, for huntsmen. Please, can you tell me the name of this species? And I said, oh, wow, I will have a look. And then I saw, no, it has not a name yet. So I had to give a name. And then, only then, I searched in the collection of Senckenberg, for example, and I found a specimen that waited for more than 100 years in our shelves and was not described or detected as a new species. So this is how it goes sometimes. And um, so you can use these names or the naming process to, to make a difference. For example, when I would have named it Heteropoda flavescens or a yellow spider or so, then it probably never would have got this attention, let's say, around the world. Then there are names difficult to digest. Uh, my arachno block is uh, frozen uh, in the meantime, but at that time I wrote a blog about um, names against human overpopulation. And <laughs> Atul also mentioned this one, Heteropoda homestool is a short form for homo stultus, which means stupid man. And of course, how stupid can a man be uh, or a being be to destroy the planet. This is our base for our life. <laughs> I, I, I don't know um, yeah, what, what else should be happened that we are recognizing that we need the planet. The planet don't need us, right? Doesn't need us. So, um, and all these names are uh, probably described by myself and, and, and chosen by myself because I was a bit angry and I wanted to change something. But uh, what, I, what I really got from these names is that these names really does not work for, uh, you know, for, for uh, public outreach. Um, a positive name like David Bowie, if you like David Bowie, it's positive, of course. Uh, it's much uh, better um, when, you, when you would like to transfer a message uh, than these names, which are a bit depressing. Yeah, okay. Um, this I also uh, like also here. Agiope dang. Dang means uh, loud in Lao language. And, and I collected uh, the type specimens along the river shore of the Nam Song, a contributory river to the Mekong, in uh, close to um, what is called Wang Yang. And there were these very loud techno discotheques. <laughs> yeah, and I was really angry about it. So and I, I, I call this uh, dang and this. Okay. Let's go further. What can we do with names? Um, there is a very nice program. I know there's also a kind of similar program in Australia and in USA, but I guess the Biopart program, the German pendant is um, a bit uh, more successful in a way. Um, what we are doing here is we are offering to give a name to a species 
against a donation of a minimum of 2,600 euros. Um, and the good thing is that this is the money, this amount of money is fairly split into a half, 50 50. 50% 50 is going to the describing institute, so not myself <laughs> uh, personally, but for the scientific research, of course. And then 50% is, and that's most important, going to the country and region of origin. So um, this uh, money can be applied for. Uh, and I, I uh, for example, when Lipon, my former student in Laos, Hi Lipon, is watching, um, I, I gave him money for two and a half years study in Laos uh, for his master's study. Then we printed a poster you have seen already, but I will show you again. Uh, I, I organized a conference there and um, this is quite easy money. It was probably 15,000 euros, uh, which I got from these um, six species. And um, yeah, it's uh, quite interesting. And if someone rich is watching, Atul, yeah, and you would like to have a, no, of course, you need not to because you are in our circles. Anyhow, if you know someone, you probably also uh, can give a word and then um, we will spread the message that uh, this possibly is poss uh, possible. What is here? At Mitzi waiting room. Ah, oh, no, okay. Uh, I'm a bit confused with some <laughs> annotations here, sorry. Okay, now I would like to share some uh, insights of my current ongoing research. Only a few uh, slides and then we are done. So I know in some cases in Japan it's almost night, okay, and probably you're a bit tired. So I will hurry up right now. So, for example, this picture. Uh, was uh, taken by Marika Beneke or Marila Benete, I don't know, uh, from South Africa and was uh, taken in the province in Waterberg. And it shows quite uh, surely uh, olio species. And uh, I had to promise, I, I don't know, was it Abhijit or Prashant, to do something about olios because. Uh, the spider species shown on the announcement for this meeting was an olio species. Um, and so I started uh, a revision probably two, three years ago. Uh, olio is a very huge genus. It was the largest genus in uh, the Sporacidae. There were 200 or are ah, still 232 nominal species worldwide and no revision was available. And I start now with the first part of a, comprehe a comprehensive revision. And after this first part, we will have less than 100 species, uh, true olio species. Yeah? Others are transferred, others are considered nomina dubia and so on and so forth. I uh, distinguish eight species groups and three of them are revised in this uh, first part. Six new species are described as well. So let's have a look in one of these. Anna, oh, no. first of all, I would like to show you that was a base for my revision. All these dots and specimens, of course, I have seen. And you can see it is a typical Afro Asian element together with Southern Europe, the Mediterranean. Um, the three dots here in um, Germany, these are imported specimens and probably one in Czech Republic, I think. Um, and, but there's no stable population yet, but I included them anyhow, just to show that there are some uh, imports here. What you also can see is that um, Olios does not like uh, deserts, very arid, uh, vegetation-less habitats. This is not the, 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 the best habitat for Olios. So they like uh, plants, they are nocturnal hunters, mostly in foliage. Uh, and you can also see that here are some white patches and these white patches are good oh, here look for Borneo wow these patches are good for citizen scientists yeah how would it come so first of all this is Olios agelasius group this is one group I revised here with the type species Olios agelasius uh, depicted here um, on the right side and Agelasus is a typical Mediterranean element. More, most of it, it's uh, Northern uh, Mediterranean, but there's also some in the Northern African part. Then Canariensis, it's a very small range endemics here on the Canary Islands. Then you have Pictus, which has a Northern African distribution to Arabian here. 
And the fasciculatus also a very wide range here, but also with yeah, large gaps. And actually this was a species with the most synonyms. Um, so I have to synonymize many species which were described under different names, but are in fact fasciculatus. And then there is one new species um, I dedicated to my former PhD student, Dirk Kunz, who collected in Namibia and also in South Africa, some of these type material. And um, yeah, I just dedicated to him because he was really a very nice guy, I collected totally amazing material there. So, and then I show you here the distribution of two unrevised species groups. Names are null and void here in this case, <clears throat> but you see also there are many species, there are many new species also to describe. Um, I will do it in, in parts two, three, and so on. Um, but you can also see there are big wide gaps in between. And this is why, uh, why I show you this tonight or today or in the morning. Uh, Christina Reims is looking, watching. Hi, Chris. It's in the morning, right? <laughs> in Brazil. Okay. Um, I think he has held really welcome from citizen scientists. And uh, this is actually the photo. I, I cut off the um, um, announcement uh, picture here, which was really nicely made. <laughs> Thank you for that. And yeah, why not approaching the goal that amateurs, photographers, nature lovers, citizen scientists, call them as you want sent one time specimens in for scientific revisions to the persons in charge. Because my restriction is I'm only one person. I cannot be all in, in these countries at the same time, or I, I cannot do this in one lifetime. It's not possible. But if we join forces and everyone would, would work together, it would be possible. Of course, there are some uh, legal issues. Of course, we have to uh, consider the export and import uh, limitations, let's say, of the particular countries. Um, but again, if we form probably a grassroots movement, it would convince uh, the governments that this material is not stolen, let's say, as a biological heritage, but it's deposited after the revision again in the country of origin, then probably one time it would be possible. Okay, <clears throat> this is my probably my dream uh, that we can work together. A similar thing happened with Thunberga from Madagascar. Um, probably some of you are um, uh, yeah, aware that I described the genus from Madagascar and I named it for Thunberga, uh, Thunberga uh, Greta Thunberg, sorry, <laughs> uh, Greta Thunberg, the climate activist. And um, yeah, many, uh, all photos here has been, uh, have been taken before. Uh, the genus was named. And so these were just photos. Uh, for example, this year, Thunberga nocibiensis is the only one we, uh, we can identify actually um, from a photo. This was considered sometimes as Heteropoda venatoria, but it's certainly not. You can see the, the pointed abdomen, you can see here these oval uh, muscle sigilla, and you can see also, probably not as good, as a bigger photo here. Uh, first of all, the dotted uh, legs and uh, prosoma here, and you can see also some lines here. This is typically for uh, Tumberga nocibiensis. Then all these photos provide some information. This is also a very important point of view here in uh, terms of science together with citizen science. So you can see here a wasp cutting off the legs and using these Tumberga specimens for uh, its, uh, its offspring. Then you can see a Thunberga uh, catching a cricket here, whatever, uh, grasshopper. Then you can see a Thunberga catching a moth. These two pictures are from uh, Professor Lutz Thilo Wassertal from Erlangen. And he made some research on hawk moth and, and uh, um, looked into the evolutionary lengthening of the proboscis and uh, showed that the proboscis lengthening is due to an escape uh, answer, reply to these predators waiting in the flowers. So it's really a cool thing. So this um, hawk moss had apparently a too short proboscis. <laughs> yeah, okay, but this is all important information. And I never have seen um, before live pictures or pictures or 
photos of live specimens of Thunberger. And now I know most of them have a small white patch here, which is really uh, diagnostic for this genus, not in all species, but in many other species. Yeah, okay, so here also we can work together. Yeah, Thunberger reloaded, what's going on here? I uh, got some new material from uh, the California Academy of Sciences who were very active in collecting in Madagascar and from the uh, Museum of, for Central Africa in Tervuren in Belgium. And I recognized 25 new species. You see here the distribution map, which is without depicting uh, the distribution of Thunberger nocibiensis, which is very widely distributed. Uh, but all other species have quite small range, uh, uh, small ranges and are considered really uh, endemics for, for these small ranges. Um, but as you can see here, this is a picture by Nikki Bay. Probably Nikki is also there. And um, <coughs> this picture was only identified after I described it, of course, as Thunberger nocibiensis. And you can see here that Thunberger is really following into human settlements and then distributed all over the whole country um, and also on, on small islands, uh, Nossi Bay and other small islands adjacent islands. Okay, and then a last insight of what I will do. You know my hatchet poda David Bowie, and you know I, I was very sad when David died, uh, and probably many others were. And, and here you see a revision um, of a genus which is now called Stiltenus, but it is not. It's a cooperational work um, with Arnaud Henra and Rudy Joquet and others. Uh, Daniele Polotov from Brazil, and we uh, will have a molecular paper for tenets, and we recognize that this formerly tenus species are certainly uh, belonging to a different genus, and I have to sort out whether it's already described or not. But what I found out is I found almost 40 new species all over <clears throat> from the Nepal Himalaya down to Papua New Guinea, and I started here with naming them after either characters, albums, or songs of David Bowie, and started here with the very early uh, uh, um, albums, like um, Hunky Dory and uh, Ziggy Stardust and so on, and then ending up with the very late and latest and last album, Black Star, uh, on Papua New Guinea. <coughs> so some people may say I'm crazy. OK, I'm crazy. I'm a weirdo, no matter. But I like it, and probably others like it too. And probably we can make a difference with all these names. Actually, uh, these so-called tenor species look almost all the same. So with the photo, we cannot certainly identify them. <laughs> we really need some uh, genitalia here. OK, future prospects. Only a few slides, and you uh, can go to bed or go to breakfast or whatever. Um, first of all, I would like to make taxonomy great again. Um, not in a sense like Trump would do this with America, you know, that's bullshit. But anyhow, um, I, I would like to involve not only the people now listening to this talk, but more people. Probably you can uh, spread the word and, and say, yeah, why not? And, and trying to build a bottoms up movement to convince governments that we really uh, need um, a more rapid. Uh, let's say, way of describing our biodiversity and protecting it then. And then we could invent or copy tools which were successful elsewhere. So one of these tools is, for example, our RNE. This is Spiders of Euros website, Europe website, uh, where there's a key. And there are for, especially also for Europe, but also for Germany, it's a very fine grid um, distributional maps where everyone can participate of course, there's a host and filtering all these incoming um, data, but then we will have such a nice maps. Um, then another thing which I invented in uh, the year 2000, together with other colleagues here in Germany, the spider of the year, which could be easily applied, I think, to Singapore, Australia, China, or elsewhere. Um, you need just a committee. Now we have, I think, in, in the European spider of the year, more than 20 countries and their representatives and they are voting and electing one species or a genus in this case now and um, here the, you can see the map here uh, it is Pizora mirabilis um, this is a type species for all pizorids worldwide 
And the black dots represent the knowledge which we had before we made it to the spider of the year, collected in the spider of the year. And the red dots were incoming data after we had it. And you can see here the hits of, the, of our uh, website, of the Aragas website, our society's website, uh, just after uh, the release, the press release, we have really many hits. So you can also use the spider of the year to promote a website a bit. Yeah, so I think easily done. And then again, my poster, which is really nine random, almost random pictures, which show how nice spiders could be, how beautiful they are, how uh, useful they are. Here is a crab spider eating a cockroach, and how interesting behavior they have. Uh, yeah, they, they they eat ants or or have some <laughs> webs to go here, like uh, Asianopis here, and I'm made in our language and in English language, just to make people aware that spiders are part of our nature and that we can do something about it. And this last slide show you the example I already mentioned before. Uh, in the case of Lephistius Kantan in Malaysia, um, which was uh, the, the, the study was done by the late Tony Witten, Nice Price and another colleague, Al Clemens. Um, and they really, made it happen that this quarry here had to stop because in this part part is um, still a, a good part of the cave where uh, Lephistius Cantan lived as the only place on our planet they stopped it and protected it okay so I think this is a good message to close uh, so let's do it together and we can make a difference so I have to thank you um, I have to thank, first of all, my teachers um, for telling the secrets of taxonomy, which was Hans-Jürgen Hoffmann in Cologne, Jochen Martens in Mainz, and Manfred Grassoff in Frankfurt. Then, of course, I would like to thank for all the people who probably did not give their permission, but I used their, their photos, which was uh, Remy Jodelin, Lucy Lovain, Nicky Bay, Didier Dessouin, Dier Kunz, etc. And then, thanks to all the spiders, of course, being so patient during my descriptions, <clears throat> and then I have to thank Atul, Abhijit, and Prashant, not named here, and the whole team for organizing this. It's really a very nice uh, uh, tool, let's say. And um, yeah, thanks to all of you for watching and listening. Hope to see you again. Bye bye. Uh, Dr. Peter, we have a few questions for you. Mm -hmm. So let me go through them one by one. Okay, Roger S. Paul says, I am studying in class seven. I am interested in spiders, which are the common species in Germany? Which are the most common species in Germany? Yeah. Oh my God. We, we have, in Germany, we have 1000 spider species. Species on that. And of course there are some species very, very common. And probably the most common spider species we see usually are the house spider, uh, Eratigena atrica and the daddy long leg Folcus phalangioides um, because we see them easily in housings. But when it comes to natural habitats, there might be much more common spiders like Erigona atra or Tenifantis tenuis or other linifids. So it's, it's really hard to say which is the most common. Yeah. Pavan Ramachandra asks Every taxonomical name has got a story. I think it will not only be interesting, but will also help easy remembrance of names if there is a provision to include the same in paper. Yeah, it, it is about vernacular names. And I admit that scientific names are for, I say normal people, please don't misunderstand me. Normal people means they, they never studied uh, Latin or Greek as I did. And so it's not easy to recognize these sometimes very complicated names. And therefore, vernacular names is, of course, much better for uh, their purpose. But a vernacular name is sometimes, or in many cases, not really uh, very accurate. And uh, for example, in uh, Germany, we, uh, we made one thing. When we uh, had the spider of the year elected, we gave it one vernacular name. And this was an official vernacular name. And now we have a full list of vernacular names for all uh, German spiders. 
Yeah. Um, so this would be one um, thing because, let's say, we have uh, eight species of Caracantium, which are called in German Dornfinger, which means forefinger. It's just translated from the Latin or Greek name. Uh, and uh, one of those dawn fingers is very, very, uh, or much more venomous than others. It's Caracansum punctorium. I was bitten by it, and I let it bite, and I know it is. So, but many people are talking about just dawn finger. I said, no, which dawn finger? And so on. So, and then there is a kind of confusion. So, therefore, I like scientific names, although I know it is sometimes hard to pronounce and to recognize. I'm sorry. Luis Rock asks, how much of the emphasis currently placed on impact factor ratings do you feel is contributing to the decrease in publications across all journals? Oh, oh, oh I, I didn't get this um, question. So it was about impact factor? Yes, how much of the emphasis currently placed on impact factor ratings do you feel is contributing to the decrease in publications across all <clears> journals? <throat> <sighs> Actually, the, the publications of uh, taxonomy, they are not decreasing, they're increasing, yeah? And this is quite good. Uh, but the problem we have is that students, young scientists who would like to enter the lifestyle of a scientist, the career of a scientist, they have to rely on this, sorry, I have to say it, fucking impact factor, uh, sorry about this, I have to say. Um, and, and so they have to follow it, otherwise they wouldn't get a job. And uh, I think that this is the problem because then uh, scientific research is not free any longer, but uh, biased by what is, um, what is thought to be sexy in, in terms of impact factor. Yeah? And therefore, I think um, we, we, we should abolish this impact factor because uh, in former times, when when uh, some um, professors or directors would like to know about the qualifications of a candidate, they would read our papers, and they can still do. They they can read all the PDFs we have in the web. So, and this is not a problem. And this impact factor is really reducing us to a number, which is really unfair, I guess. Ian Mondal asks. Just as you said about the small white dot in case of Thunberga, would it be possible to point out some simple pointer for very uh, similar looking genera like heteropoda, pseudopoda, and synopoda? <laughs> yeah, when it would be so easy. <laughs> um, actually, for example, when we take heteropoda, synopoda, pseudopoda, butaniella, probably butaniella is a synonym of pseudopoda, we don't know yet, but we'll see. Um, then I have to say, I have to admit, it is about copulatory organs in the first hand. From time to time, I can see with my experience some differences, but I cannot uh, pack these differences really in words. I cannot really uh, describe it in, in, in a such short manner like the white dot or something like this. I could say, if you have a sheath-like conductor in the male pulp, it's a heteropoda or a yinzi in Australia, but um, yeah, it is, it is not that easy. I'm sorry, taxonomy is more complex. Hello, can... Question? No, there are. Yes, <laughs> ah, yes, hi, sorry. Uh, uh, actually, Siddharth... Atul, uh, sorry, who's reading the question, Atul? This is uh, Vipin, one of the team members of Team Saliga. Okay, can you can you just send it to my email address and then I, I would have them here on the screen. All the questions, is it? Yeah, why not? Yeah, you, uh, are, you can see the chat box there. You can uh, see the chat box. Till yes. I am, ah, it is done. Oh, wh where is yeah. it? You know, I'm... No, uh, till I, yeah, till I am, you have answered. There is a question from Siddharth. Next question is from Siddharth. <laughs> But what, what, where I can see the, those? Uh, Peter, on the extreme yeah. right hand side, on the top, you can see uh, three dots where you have. Yeah. You must be having yeah. some notification. As a chat. You see, yeah, the, the chat. chat. That, yeah. Here, yes, yes, the chat. Off. Okay. Thank you very much. You're a perfect host. <laughs> yeah. Um. So. Okay. Indonesia. No. This is from Isma Dwi Kurin. Uh, 
Kurniawan. Okay, sorry for pronunciation. Um, I never have been in Indonesia, but I uh, used some material collected in Indonesia, either by, by natural history collections or by, by recent collections. And um, actually for Hetropoda, this is a very big genus. You know, it's almost 200 species right now, described species. And I have here in my shelves, my collection room, probably 400 to 500 new species. And I have to uh, sort, first of all, some other projects out. And then I will start with Hetropoda and going north to south and from west to east. And then probably when I'm uh, retired, it is done. OK? <laughs> but, but anyhow, if, if you have a species you cannot identify, you may send it to me. I will store them here, and I will send, send them certainly back to your lab if you need the material back, OK? Um, then we have Rio Shida. Ah, that was Japanese, right? Hello. Uh, the only Oleus spider in Japan is Oleus japonicus. Although they are very rare, I was wondering is there any chance left to find a new species of Oleus in Japan? Aha, uh -huh. maybe. I got a message from Hirotsugo Ono, um, who's retired already, but still active, of course. And he found a species which is, um, oh, what was it? I, I forgot the name, but there's another species which might be in, uh, introduced, um, but we don't know yet. Um, Olios um, is, uh, let's say, Japan is on the very um, border of the region range, of Olios, so they, I, I therefore doubt that there is um, uh, many Olios species to describe from there. But who knows? Probably just go there <laughs> and find some new one. <laughs> um, so, uh, Peter, there are a few unanswered questions uh, after Ayan because I, I, I think you're reading the last questions. There are. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, see, you're yeah, much yeah. better than I am. Yeah, so after Ayan is Siddharth. If you want me to read it, I'll read it out for you. I, I Siddharth. Okay. And now, now, yeah. now I have a point. Hi, Peter. Are yeah. there opportunities in Europe for citizen scientists to get training in spider taxonomy under supervision of established arachnologists? Ach, Siddharth Kulkani. Namaste. <laughs> um, um, actually, uh, citizen scientists are now more and more included in Germany. And um, in my lab, I have also some honorary uh, workers who um, are mainly now in the library and then sorting out uh, all the, the mess we had after <laughs> moving here in our new rooms. But I could also think of some uh, citizen scientists working um, here, and yeah, why not? So, so if if someone would like to come over, and um, yeah, um, it, it all always Siddharth is a question of um, if this citizen scientist would like to take photos of spiders and uh, would like to just yeah, let's say have fun with this kind of level of taxonomic work, um, then it probably does not make really sense. If someone has a microscope at hand, a sterile microscope or so, and would go deeper, then I surely would invest some time to uh, give him here an introduction, of course. So then, oh, sorry, I have to go, ah, yeah. Reject evolution by the, ah, oh, yeah. Oh, this is a long story and I will make it short. I, I don't, uh, belief in what these guys believe in any longer. I was Catholic one time, I was baptized, but okay, I know religion is part of the cultural evolution, and uh, so uh, the biological evolution is uh, much more important. Thank you. <laughs> it, it would be, it would be go too far, I guess. Sorry for that. Uh, Shogo Noguchi from Japan, Kyushu University. This is not a question. But I'm not good at English. I'm sorry, I'm not good at English. Okay. I was inspired by Herbert Tsuguono and I like spiders. In the future, I will be a spider researcher. I'm very happy to hear. This is very good. Thank you very much for this positive feedback. This is exactly uh, what the talk was about. And if it fulfills only in one person, then it's perfect. So, Yap Min Yang. Good evening. I'm a college student living in Malaysia. I've been interested in arachnology my whole life. And my dreams is becoming an arachnologist. How can I help out my local scientists? Huh. Um, so, so the question is how you can help the local scientists or how can I help you? 
they do or uh, so actually if you, if you would like to win our acknowledges it's it is your decision what you would like to be in in which level you are happy let's say yeah if your te taxonomic center in your brain is uh, satisfied with uh, looking and taking photos and and observing the behavior and and uh, yeah, uh, exchanging this knowledge in Facebook groups is fine. If you would like to go beyond that and would like to, let's say, <clears throat> yeah, step into active taxonomy or something like this, or identifying first mystics, ecology, uh, then of course you have to consider some uh, taxonomic works. You have to buy a microscope or probably go to university where a microscope is available. Yeah. I, I don't know whether it's possible in Malaysia, but um, yeah, this would be the way. And you certainly should ask yourself which level of taxonomy or uh, um, yeah, whether it's a hobby or it should be more than a hobby, you would like to choose to be happy. <laughs> uh, so Debomai Chanda, is pseudopoda containing two different species groups, as you mentioned about their conductor in your paper. Oh my God, pseudopoda is a big, big genus. I don't know how many species are described right now. I, I can check it out uh, here. Ah, it's good. I have a second computer here. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> let's see. So, sporacic, genera. All oh, the world spider catalog is really a nice tool. Uh, Pseudopoda. Here we go. Species. It's now 142 species described. And I guess it's at least 500, if not more, species. Um, if we're cutting the forest, if we're logging the forest, then of course we need not to describe as many. But okay, um, there are much more different species groups than are known today. There are much more than two. And actually, uh, it will be probably only solved by molecular uh, research because the, the uh, morphology is, uh, how can I say it? It's such a complex things, and you cannot recognize parallel conversion evolutionary pathways and so on. So we have to stick to molecular research. I provided some of my or most of my samples to some Chinese colleagues, and uh, hopefully it will be published uh, in a time, let's say in a reasonable time. Hopefully answer this question. Amy Lin Dupo. Thank you for this enlightening lecture. How might we address the decreasing number of young people doing spider taxonomy? Any tips? Yeah. Um, first of all, um, when a student is approaching me in my lab and asking myself, Peter, may I make a thesis in your research and say, I said, general, yes. But then in particular, I will tell the, yeah, disadvantages to be a researcher in this impact factor. Um, you have to uh, show a, a big amount of grant money, otherwise you won't get a job. There is a strong competition. It's not this a bit, let's say, romanticized picture of uh, taxonomy or science in general, um, but it's more a battlefield. whether you would like to keep it as a hobby and also in a hobby, you can do fantastic. Oh, your internet connection is unstable. My God, why? Can you still see me, Atul? Can you hear me? Yeah, 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 we are able to. Okay, thank you, thank yes, you. Yes, yes. I got this message. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so therefore, you can decide whether you have it as a hobby. For example, uh, Octavius Pickett Cambridge or Frederick Octavius Pickett Cambridge or other famous arachnologists were not uh, decent arachnologists, uh, meaning they had no position as arachnologists, but were teachers, they were a priest, and they did it as a hobby. And uh, so therefore, this might be also a satisfying uh, part, let's say. Okay, then we are really interesting session, Peter. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> for this comment. Very thoughtful concept of bridging the gap between scientists and citizen scientists. Is there any common platforms in place if we are to help in mapping the history of key species? How could we help? Yeah. In, in Germany, we have already these platforms and uh, probably, uh, I don't know where you're from, 
Mohit Chenoy, I cannot really <laughs> say it right now. Um, you should probably approach your local um, country society or continent society, let's say the Asian society, and probably they should establish something like this. And then you have a platform. Uh, there is not a platform yet worldwide, let's say. And um, I guess these platforms should be established more and more. And then they probably should be connected to real really worldwide big platform uh, for all scientists, yeah. But probably we should be patient there uh, for a while. So Bala Chandran, thank you so much for the informative talk. Your emphasis on the larger picture of conservation is worth em emulating by taxonomists. The ultimate goal is to conserve the species in the habitat. Thank you again. Okay, nice comment. Thank you for the comment. Uh, Galaxy J7, please tell something about courtship display. Oh my God, shall I make Maratus <laughs> Volans. No, uh, actually, I'm not an uh, ethologist. I'm not doing behavioral studies. Um, courtship is, is, in very short sentences right now here, courtship is, of course, uh, very interesting. It's uh, species specific in most cases. And um, it depends on the group. It's sometimes chemo-sensitively uh, induced, but it's sometimes uh, visually induced, like in jumping spiders or in wolf spiders. And uh, yeah, it is all kind of senses are used by the female to detect which male is approaching, whether it's the right male and whether it is performing right, yeah, correctly. And then, uh, um, yeah, offspring is coming soon, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, this is what I can say here in this, um, in this place. Are all species of Cynopora cave dwelling? No, they're not. Good question. Um, most of them actually are, uh, are living in the litter, for example, in China, almost all, there are also some cave species, but uh, most of them, or in Japan, are in the litter, in the leaf litter of forests and so on. And then in Malaysia, for example, we had them at Fraser's Hill on trees, but also in the leaf litter. And these trees had these mosses around, so it was quite a nice microhabitat. But certainly, Sinopoda need a certain kind of humidity, yeah? So otherwise they cannot survive. Hopefully this is done. Then Dirai Dulipeta, sorry for pronouncing it badly. Thank you, sir, it was very informative for new taxonomists. Okay, good luck then with taxonomy. Uh, Ryoshida was already answered. <coughs> sorry, that's water. Hello, sir, can you please tell about the venomous spiders? Yeah, actually I don't like to tell about uh, too much about venomous spiders because they are not, first of all, there are not so many venomous spiders. Um, you consider that we have 48 plus thousand species worldwide known, and there are only probably 50 or so, which could cause some real damage to human tissue and so on, the nerve system. Uh, it's not really wor uh, worth to uh, talk about it. I think you should inform, or everyone should inform him or herself uh, about the venomous spider spiders in their environment, in their country where they live, and then they can go out easily and avoid it. Yeah. So for example, when I go to Laotian caves or Cambodian caves, there is Loxoscelis ufescens, the brown recluse spider. And of course, when I see some of these cribbled webs, I'm a bit full. I'm not touching the hand without seeing where I touch the rock and so on. So it's easy uh, how we can avoid it. Um, only a hello, sir. That's, yeah, hello, Anjali. <laughs> and then there is a message from Isma Dvi Kurniavan. Ah, this was Indonesia question. This is also done. Um, still unanswered questions. Yes, I have done this, I guess. DP, have you studied some spiders from desert ecosystems? Yes. And I have been rarely to deserts, but I got some material from deserts. And um, for example, Sebrenos in uh, Northern Africa and Central Asia and so on and Arabia. And uh, these are also very interesting spiders. Uh, also in, in Southern Africa, I described a new uh, genus, Mai, uh, M-A-Y spelled. And uh, very interestingly, they had a special CT, which I call Lawrence CD, uh, which were um, um, absent in all other sparacids and only present in these uh, genus, yeah. But I like more 
the tropical spiders, to be honest. <laughs> um, from Deja Dulipeta, Seal, does evolution of spiders and radiations have impact on the structural changes of copulatory organs? Yeah, what else should have uh, impact on the copulatory organs? So, of course, the evolution, um, it's, it's part of the evolution that uh, structures changes due to mutations and the selection will grab the good ones and the bad ones will die. So this is uh, the, the, the theorem, let's say, of the evolution. And um, it is not easy when you would like to point out um, how certain structures have evolved and how they changed. Uh, this is sometimes not easy to see and we would need um, um, yeah, morpho-functional analyses, let's say. What I did one time is, I, this, this seems to be cruel, but I, I can tell that spiders died very quickly. I had spiders in copulation and I poured fluid nitrogen above them, so they immediately frozen, were frozen there. And then I, I had it in a micro CT and could see how these structures worked together and probably gave some insight how these structures also evolved. Yeah, But I did this only in two spider species. And this is, of course, uh, not enough. Not but if you would like to go into this, I can give you some hints. Yeah, but this is a totally other field, let's say, and I kind of do this beside my taxonomic work. Um, I would like to go beyond that very much. No, I'm sorry, I didn't get this. Then, Eva Kupic, thank you for this great lecture. I'm trying to raise some awareness on spider diversity. In I've been there in uh, Saftat. <laughs> and since binominal names are a bit too much for most people, would you suggest creating some creation names for them or would it be just wasting time in your opinion? Certainly, it is really worth to create creation names for them. And I would get in touch with uh, Gordana Gribic from Serbia in Novi Sad because they, uh, she invented the Spider Day in, in November, I guess, in, in Novi Sad. And they made wonderful events and uh, please get in touch with uh, Gordana Gribic. Uh, if you contact me via Facebook, I can give you the ID. And uh, because I think Serbian and Croatian language uh, is quite close, although probably <laughs> cultures are a bit far away, but uh, uh, probably you could join there also some forces and make some names together uh, so that you're not have a parallel evolution of naming species, okay? Uh, but it would be, certainly it would be uh, uh, worth to do that. From Pavan Ramachandra, what are basic requirements to set up a lab? Oh my God. Um, first of all, you would need a microscope. And the microscope, um, if you would go for uh, the active taxonomy with a drawing device, yeah? Uh, if you uh, go to my Facebook site, you probably have seen the video. If not, you can watch it again. Uh, there, I I show this microscope there. It need not to be a microscope which is 14,000 euros like I have here. Uh, it, it can be probably 2,000 euros, it's still a lot of money, but um, otherwise, as I pointed out in my lecture, uh, then probably you cannot go into active taxonomy. Uh, if you uh, would like to just identify spiders, you just can omit the, this drawing device, which is here in my case, more than 1,500 euros alone. Um, so, and then you can go for a, <clears throat> a more basic version of a stereo microscope just for identifying species. It's also possible, but it really depends on what you need. And of course you need a computer with the internet to download all the uh, taxonomic literature uh, or other literature, which we have in our um, Word Spider catalog. And here, um, probably I, I, may, I may short what means announcement, it's also a wish or a dream. The Asian Society of Arachnology was um, uh, founded by, by some members uh, when we met with Lee Shuizang, Yeru Tsuba Ono and myself in Laos and in other members, I think 50 members or so. And uh, at that time, I had the idea to make a non-taxonomic literature database uh, for uh, members of the Asian Society. Um, I can provide many of this literature. I think the ta taxonomic literature is 
covered in the uh, wet spider catalog, but for the non-taxonomic literature, which means behavior or uh, venoms or uh, whatever, uh, physiology, uh, ecology, and phonistics, there uh, could be also a platform to share all these um, literature for free. Would be a good idea, I guess. Okay, um, then. Dr. Anjali, hello, sir. Thanks for the great presentation. What is the future of molecular taxonomy? Because you're working on morphotaxonomy, I would like to know your opinion on this topic. Okay, first of all, um, morphology and molecular are not fighting against each other. They're not competing, but they're uh, completing uh, them, themselves, let's say. Okay, so this means if a morpho guy like me is coming to an end, so I have probably two forms I cannot distinguish or I cannot say whether it's really or decide whether it's really a new species or probably only a vari variation, um, then probably molecular study could do that. Yeah? Uh, what I learned from my experience is in at least 90%, you can work with morphology alone. Morphology is a really nice tool when you go for <coughs> uh, the details when you have a really good microscope and, and depict all the characters, okay? Um, and the molecular taxonomy is absolutely interesting and there were amazing results, but I won't invest my time into this because molecular taxonomy is really a field on its own. You, you have to follow the, the most recent trends of, of uh, getting the DNA uh, of, of uh, sequencing it and so on and so forth. And it's not only molecular, it's now uh, not genetic, it's genomics now. And uh, it, it's really um, exploding, let's say. And therefore I'm not a molecular guy, but uh, I, I like to see uh, molecular results. Probably one, one hint or one recommendation. If you molecular results, um, don't do it only for the purpose of getting an impact factor publication, because then you have something like this, oh, there's a tree with some uh, taxa, but it is not complete and we cannot say everything and so on and so forth. Um, it's, it's about, I, I think it's about wasting money and wasting time, wasting resources. Uh, these resources should be really invested into morpho taxonomy because our taxonomy don't need much, you know, of course, a microscope and so on, but otherwise you need a pencil and a scissor and what you say, forceps and so on, then you, you're done, you know, you can do what I want. Uh, molecular <coughs> re uh, research should be really focused on, on str probably strategic, very important questions, or when you collected really a number of probably island species and it's almost or near to complete and you can really say something then, then it, it makes sense, in my opinion. It's my personal opinion. Uh, sorry, I have to drink. It's rhubarb juice, actually, very good in this hot summer. Mm. Perfect. So I hope this um, is good uh, for answering this question, Dr. Anjali. Then from Isma Dwik Kunniavan. Thank you, Dr. Peter. Limited spider taxonomy in Indonesia, but we have thousand spiders. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully I can be the next spider taxonomist. That's a very good uh, saying. In the countries where we have the highest diversity, there's really uh, the lowest density of taxonomists because taxonomy is not considered, let's say, probably a proper job or it's not appreciated at probably as it is here in Europe or in the US or um, elsewhere. So it's, it's really, or in Brazil, for example, it's, it's really um, a problem. Uh, I see, and therefore, I would say when when we could join forces in terms of uh, you collect some specimen and you could send them over or send them to a scientist who could send them over, or you can send them to a scientist or go to the scientist and uh, illustrate them. I did so with some material from Iraq, and we described the species there. Um, of course, a, a specimen should be, or the, the, the drawings, of the specimen should be then accurately done, of course, and you should be should do the measurements. Then we have a should or could we could have a cooperational paper then. Yeah, it's not a problem. Okay. And from Aswati, 
Thank you, sir, for an interesting session. Spiders are an eclectic group of invertebrates. So how is it possible to bring about this change in coming days, especially in their conservations? Yeah, they're certainly neglected still. And um, as, I, as I told you in my talk, I try to, to make a difference in, in giving some names, in, in, in being in, let's say, some media, yeah, involved in media things like documentaries or whatever, newspapers. <clears throat> and of course, these special names like Thunberger, Greta, help there a lot. Um, and I think you can try in your particular country as well to make a difference. And if you start only with a regional um, um, project, let's say, uh, for example, you have different spider webs and these spider webs occur on certain spots every year. And then you make a small sign which are printed uh, with a printed text. You can laminate this uh, to protect it uh, from rain. And then you will explain to the public who's uh, going along these webs and probably they got, get more and more interested. And uh, so it's a very personal individual uh, investment, let's say. Uh, you will find then others who will join. And uh, this is what I like also about the idea of uh, Abhijit and Atul and Prashant's um, idea of having this kind of host. And you see, we can probably move something, okay, in the right direction, in our opinion. I guess these are the questions, right? Yes, that was the last question for the day. <laughs> so uh, with this, we have reached the last part of our, the webinar, that is the vote of thanks. I'll do the honors. On behalf of Team Saliga and all the participants of this webinar, I would like to thank you for the amazingly insightful talk, Dr. Peter Yeager. Thank you very much for taking the time and sharing your amazing knowledge. Yeah. Uh, taxonomy itself is threatened as we all know and we are uh, knowing nowadays, but we really hope this talk and the talks like this will encourage and motivate more people to take up taxonomy in the coming days. Uh, I would also like to thank all the participants for their time and participation. Thank you all. With this, we have come to the end of this session and we would like to wrap this session up. Thank you again. Good day. Yeah, very welcome. All the best for all of you. And yeah, I hope to see you again, I guess, right? Yes, yes definitely. Yes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yes. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Bye. Bye, bye Peter. Thanks bye. a lot. Shukriya.